Good afternoon. Uh, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. I'm delighted to warmly welcome all of you to the 21st annual conference, widely known as the CAF Conference, organized by CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America, the Inter-American Dialogue, and the Organization of American States. Thanks to all of you for joining us. It's wonderful to see so many great friends and close colleagues. For the dialogue, this annual gathering is extremely important. It affords a special opportunity to bring together and engage diverse leaders, not only from this hemisphere, but globally, from Europe, Asia, and Africa, to review the recent developments in the Americas, discuss a wide range of issues, and explore ways to best advance our mission of fostering democratic governance, social equity, and prosperity in Latin America and the Caribbean. The timing is also critical. In the United States, the conference comes right after Labor Day, marking the end of summer with a very busy fall just around the corner. The original idea was that right after a sleepy, relaxing Washington summer, people would be eager to assemble, to refresh, to recharge, and to catch up on and try to make sense of what is happening throughout the Americas. As all of you have probably heard, this summer in Washington has been very slow and uneventful. Normal, boring, run-of-the-mill summer. Let me extend special thanks and warm congratulations to Luis Carranza, who assumed the presidency of CAF just over five months ago. I appreciate the confianza and the opportunity to start our third decade of collaboration on what has become a widely anticipated conference. I also want to thank CAF's excellent staff, especially Gian Piero Leoncini, who has worked closely over the past months with the Dialogue's own stellar team. Let me give special recognition and thanks to Joan Caivano and to Missy Reef. We're very grateful for your tireless efforts. Let me also recognize and thank the co-chair of the Inter-American Dialogues Board, uh, Carla Hills, who has uh, always been a tremendous supporter and is here every year in the conference, and we're very grateful to her. Uh, Ambassador Hills is the former U.S. Trade Representative, uh, and she's the chair and CEO of Hills & Company. So thank you, Carla, for being with us. It's never easy to come up with a fully satisfying agenda for a day and a half conference. There are simply too many important and interesting topics to cover. But I think all of our sessions this year focus on highly pertinent issues and feature diverse first-rate speakers who reflect a range of views. Allow me to give you a flavor of what's in store for the next day and a half. Immediately following our first keynote address, by President Carranza in just a few moments, we will get varied perspectives about to what extent and in which ways Latin America fits into a rapidly shifting global order. We'll hear views from Argentina, Canada, the United Kingdom, Benin, and China. We'll then focus on a recurrent topic in this conference, the prospects for regional integration in Latin America. This time, we'll explore what, if any, implications the new administration and political environment in Washington has for that perennial challenge. We'll get perspectives from Mexico, Peru, Chile, Colombia, as well as the current U.S. Uh, administration. That will be for this afternoon. Tomorrow morning at 8.30 sharp, we will we look forward to uh, listening to our second keynote address by Rick Waddell, who is the Deputy National Security Advisor in the White House, which uh, session that will be chaired by uh, Ambassador Hills. After that, the first session 
will look at the region's economic situation and outlook in the context of the end of the commodity boom. What has come next? Are there new ideas, new policies? How is the region trying to increase growth and productivity? And we'll have an excellent set of panelists, government officials, and representatives of the development banks, Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank as well. We are pleased to feature, for the first time in 21 years, a session on facing and fighting corruption in Latin America. Accountability, transparency, and independent, the importance of independent institutions. This issue is high on the agenda in many countries. We'll learn how practitioners are tackling this issue in Guatemala, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. What progress has been there, has there been to date, and what are the impending, what are the pending challenges? We're also thrilled after that session that two of the U United States' most prominent and respected commentators, Frank Fukuyama of Stanford University and Susan Glasser of Politico, will have a conversation about the evolving new global order under the Trump administration and what it might mean for Latin America and how the region might fit in. Following a nice lunch tomorrow, and I don't know if we'll have ceviche, uh, President Carranza, but uh, that, would be a, that would be a very welcome change. Uh, we'll turn to a discussion on the electoral cycle and the changing political landscape. With elections coming up in just a few months in Chile and next year in three important Latin American countries, Colombia, Mexico, and Brazil. We will also examine the current economic and political situation, very serious situation in Venezuela, and explore scenarios in, for the coming months. We'll conclude with another first for this conference, a session on cities in the Americas, how to make them smarter, safer, and climate resist, uh, resilient. We'll hear from leading practitioners of diverse backgrounds and experiences, including current and former mayors from Latin America. So as you can see, we have a terrifically exciting and rich agenda ahead of us over the next day and a half. And I really hope that all of you can stay with us and participate with your questions and comments. Uh, that will make the conference particularly successful. It is now a great, my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Luis Carranza, CAF's president since last April. President Carranza has an impressive background. He served as Minister of the Economy and Finance in Peru from 2006 to 2009, presided over very important reforms in his country, and led Peru to register its highest growth rates in recent history, averaging 8%. He had also served as head of Latin America and Emerging Markets for BBVA and as a consultant for the Inter-American Development Bank. He has a doctorate in economics from the University of Minnesota. Please join me in welcoming CAF President Luis Carranza. Muy buenas tardes. I will speak in Spanish. Good afternoon. I will be speaking in Spanish. Thank you very much, Michael, for the very generous uh, introductory remarks. It is indeed a great honor, a pleasure for me to pursue a very long tradition of collaboration together with the dialogue with the Organization of American States and uh, CAF in order to discuss the issues of Latin America, to ponder on the uh, challenges we grapple with, and to analyze what is the best route toward prosperity. What I wish to do during my brief presentation this afternoon is precisely that, to ponder on uh, which are the elements of uh, this uh, structure that we must uh, consider in greater depth of this puzzle. I seem to have pushed the wrong button. 
Let us see which are the pieces of this puzzle. Very well then. Uh, in Latin America, we have undergone uh, three political pacts of great importance. The first political pact was for the sake of stability. Then came the pact for greater equality, to reduce poverty and inequality. And the relevant pact today is that for the sake of productivity and growth. Before uh, discussing the guidelines and the pillars that support this uh, pillar of productivity, I would like to review which were the two previous pacts. First of all, that of stability. Throughout the 70s, there was a decade of an over-indebtedness in Latin America. When the uh, international monetary conditions changed, the fiscal crisis uh, was already underway. The very large uh, fiscal deficits were financed by way of uh, generating more currency, which resulted in great inflation and deterioration of the standard of living in our region. This was the decade of the 80s, the so-called lost uh, decade in Latin America. This led, uh, in turn, to seeking out a pact for the sake of economic stability. These political pacts resulted in most countries in new constitutions. And they had a, a very strong institutional basis, independence of the central banking, the strengthening of the budgetary frameworks, among other measures. As a result of this, and as you may see on the slide, inflation rates seem to converge rapidly at the level of one digit. And we can say nowadays that this pact regarding macroeconomic stability in general terms was indeed a successful one. Together with the policies in order to bring about stabilization, there were implemented the structural reforms which uh, attempted to bolster the stability, but also to seek out and to promote economic growth. And the very uh, important reforms were carried out in terms of trade openings, uh, financial liberalization, privatization of public uh, companies, and so on. And indeed, the growth rate began to revitalize uh, in Latin America. Toward the end of that uh, decade of the 80s, we underwent the decade of the 90s, an economic crisis which was quite severe, not so much uh, in terms of the product. You can see that it shows a flat line. But we see it in terms of loss of employment, particularly in the formal sectors of the economy. Contraction of the internal demand, the crisis was indeed very severe. The conditions of inequality and poverty were drastically deteriorated because we did not have the necessary macroeconomic tools in order to implement anti-cyclical policies. So as a result of this uh, very severe crisis, we were obliged to seeking out a pact for the sake of equality. This happened toward the end of the 90s, uh, beginnings of, this, uh, of the present decade. In some countries, we had new constitutions. And in others, we just had a change in the orientation of public policies, trying to reduce poverty and to improve the conditions of inequality. Growth uh, throughout the 90s contributed to reducing poverty. Unfortunately, the pace of reduction was extremely slow. However, if we look at the green line, which is the line of inequality, it continued to grow, which is in keeping with the so-called Usma's line. But politically, it is uh, unacceptable because we must realize that Latin America was and continues to be the region with greatest inequalities in the world. 
So this uh, was conducive to implementing public policies geared toward the reduction of inequality with a very strong growth as far as the public expenditure. And we see that the results are indeed quite impressive. From inequality levels of some 45%, generally speaking throughout Latin America, we find that it has gone down to some 24% in a little over 10 years. The rate of inequality continues to drop uh, very speedily, very rapidly. These social transformations are extremely important if we want to understand the interrelationships, and they're transcendental as far as understanding what is happening nowadays in our countries. From the fiscal standpoint, we had two instruments, basically. The first of these was the increase of the social expenditure. Toward the end of the 90s, as an average, we had 6.7% of the GDP, which went to the social expenditure. Toward 2015, we reached uh, an average of 10.6% of the GDP as far as social expenditure is concerned, which is a significant increase in the region. In most of the countries, social expenditure accounts for some 60% of the total uh, budget of the central government, which is a very significant figure indeed. The second instrument was the expenditures uh, for infrastructure and public investment, particularly public investment geared toward reducing the gap of action to basic services of the poorest uh, population of our countries. Uh, let me present to you the case of Bolivia. In Bolivia, between 2008 and 2015, multiplied by two in terms of the product, its expenditure for the sake of public infrastructure. And if we look at the water production, the increase was 5% in terms of the product for the same time period, which is indeed extremely relevant. Uh, CAF has participated hand in hand with the, with the urban government in the water program, which has benefited more than two million Bolivians, Bolivians that is, with more than 1,500 small projects throughout the districts uh, in the country. That is extremely important. As a result of the growth and the public policies directed toward combating inequality, we had a significant increase in the middle classes in the continent and in the region as a whole. We moved from 21 percent middle classes in the year 2000 to 35 percent by the year 2015. Indeed, this is a uh, drastic transformation of the social conditions existing in our countries, which goes together with the reduction of poverty. But we must be conscious and aware of the fact that indeed the most important social class nowadays is the vulnerable one, that which is in the risk of going into dire poverty, which account for almost 40 percent of the total population in Latin America. We have some 75 percent of the social classes which are undergoing a situation of expectations and a demand for better public goods and services. And this is part of what we're witnessing today uh, in Latin America. This increase in the middle classes had a basic economic impact because it increased uh, the actual size of our domestic markets, which generates a, a very important uh, economic demand, especially in uh, non-tradable sectors. So we saw this uh, feedback between the social system on the one hand and the economic system on the other through a better allocation of resources. Uh, substantive increase in economies of scale in non-tradable sectors, and an increase also in the expenditure for innovation and uh, bringing about greater competitiveness at the entrepreneurial and sectoral levels. But politically, it had its implications as well because it generated pressures upon states in order to have a better um, uh, 
accountability and a better management of uh, a public office. What we're seeing in Latin America is precisely the result of this increase in the middle classes and the reforms and transformations uh, that we have seen in our social systems. Let me very briefly tell you about this interrelationship between the economic, political, and social systems because it is indeed uh, basic. For us, the economists, we have been trained in order to simplify things. Our mind seems to have been trained in order to reduce everything to a minimum expression. We uh, focus on economic variables. We take as uh, being exogenous or control variables, political variables, and social variables. And this seems to work very well indeed when we're analyzing a very concrete problem, such as the dynamics of inflation or the impact uh, of an increase in the tax rates, or when we analyze in a certain neighborhood like mathematicians tell us the evolution of the product in the short term. But if we want to analyze what is happening with an actual process of development in a country, we must have a comprehensive approach, comprehensive vision with an integration of these three systems. Because we have multiple interrelations which are asymmetrical with minimum thresholds in order to attain and bring about certain processes and changes in each one of the stages of development. And this depends on each in every society. This uh, takes us to uh, realize that besides the simplistic approach that the growth of Latin America is associated to what happens uh, with the actual price of the commodities, any statistical regression might show that relationship. But what is happening in Latin America nowadays is indeed extremely complex. What is happening is that the uh, economic growth episodes have had very little impact upon the transformation of political and social systems in our region, the initial conditions are indeed very harsh. Uh, because of geographic and historic reasons, we have these uh, difficult initial conditions. As part of my optimistic note, I must say that that what we're watching, this political transformation demands for better uh, situation in uh, the accountability and public transformation is a basic element in building these uh, chains of transmission between that which happens on the economic side of things and what happens as far as other systems are concerned. Let us now refer to the economic pact that we require in our region. Here we have to understand that if we want to maintain the same rate of growth and we want to hold on to the gains that we have experienced in terms of the social transformation of our region, we need this pact for productivity, this pact for growth. And we have to continue to build these bands of transmission between these three different systems. Now, an impact on productivity is going to have a direct bearing on the economy and will foster economic growth. That is going to free up fiscal resources to deepen political reforms and improve accountability systems, also better property rights and improve on the efficiency of the state in general. And that will be fueled or will become fuel for long-term economic growth. Also, in the economic sphere, it's important that we maintain our investments in uh, social sectors without incurring major fiscal debts, keeping the debt to product ratio the same. That is essential so as to not wind up in a fiscal crisis, which has unfortunately been part of our past. We looked at the gains from the stability pact, and that is something that we have to uphold and maintain. Now here, on this slide, I wanted to comment on some of the elements in the Productivity Pact. And of course, this depends on each country and each society at the moment of their development. But perhaps the most important element is a shared vision of development, a long-term vision. 
that has to be crafted by political consensus, and their leadership is essential. And here, there's good news. Unfortunately, the good news isn't across the board, but it is good news. First of all, I wanted to point to the case of Panama. Panama is a country that has uh, been leading the chart of growth rates in the long term in recent years, and it has a conditions. It can be a logistic and a services hub in the region, and it has policies designed for infrastructure and also for investment in human capital. Now, it still has a lot to do in the area of institutions, building up a civil service, increasing the efficiency of its public services, but it has a good track towards a stability ahead of us. And we see the case of Paraguay where a consensus is being forged, where they are working on infrastructure to integrate their territory by lowering transportation costs in important areas of production. That would be the meat industry and agriculture. Now, it too has uh, room for improvement in the area of institutions. The CAF and the IDB are financing the Route 9, it's called the Trans Chaco Route, and it connects uh, part of the country with great uh, agricultural and meat uh, or livestock potential with the ports in Paraguay. Also, there are cities like Medellin or Guayaquil that have had long term growth plans, regardless of what is happening with the political trends in their cities or in the country. And that is something that has proven wise. In CAF, we just signed a cooperation agreement with Aporimac. Aporimac is a very poor area in southern Peru, but it has great mining potential. And the idea is to see how we can put together long-term development plans financed with resources coming from mining. There have been many corruption scandals in the press in Peru. They're not known in the international press, but nationally, we realize that resources have been wasted, resources coming from the exploitation of natural resources. Unfortunately, this or fortunately, I'm sorry, this is not general. In Latin America, we have tremendous potential in our natural resources. Let me give you an example. Between northern Chile and southern Peru, we have 40% of the copper reserves of the entire world. But unfortunately, our countries do not have development plans that are based on maximizing the exploitation of natural resources. These development plans should involve infrastructure, institutions, education, but unfortunately, I repeat that we do not have that long-term vision. In the case of Peru, we have important mining projects that have come to a halt, not for economic reasons, not because of fluctuation in prices, but because of social and political reasons. The population does not trust uh, its corporations nor its government. Governments have to build the trust of their populations, and they have to be able to implement public policies aiming at development and also share the results, the product of exploiting these natural resources. What I'm saying is that we are wasting great opportunities because we're not making good use of our natural resources. Let me give you an example taken from Antofagasta in Chile. It is a, an intermediate mining cluster because mining resources 
natural resources in general are important to finance these reforms, to build these infrastructures, and to continue with social transformation. But also, they can create a very dynamic arrangement in terms of um, vendors and suppliers, and the mining sector in Antofagasta is a good example. It could grow much more if it took into account all of the growth opportunities in mining production in southern Peru. And that could give us a cluster spanning this whole region, southern Peru, northern Chile, that would be similar to what we find in Canada or in Australia. But for that purpose, we would need a long-term vision. We would have to know what our potential is and where we can grow and where we can make best use of yield. Now, on a completely different scale, let's address what we're doing in Ecuador, for example. These are small producers. They are corn farmers, and they have been integrated in a production chain, and they have increased their productivity by 100%. Because in Latin America, ladies and gentlemen, the major challenge is to work hard to get people out of the 19th century and to help these people become competitive enough so they can be part of the 21st century. And in the area of agriculture, there's tremendous potential, not only in terms of productivity, and not only because in terms of the economically active population, there is much to be done, but because this helps social transformation by creating formal jobs. and bringing into modern times people who currently have very poor access to services. And as I was saying, we also need to be there for those who are trying to be competitive in the 21st century. And here I wanted to share with you a program having to do with patents. This began in the area of energy, and it has expanded into other sectors. We applied this in Panama. Early in this decade, in Panama, on average, there were four patents per million inhabitants. And this year, we hope to wind up with 44 patents per one million people. So we're still far behind the world leaders. But in Panama, Panama currently leads the ranking for Latin America. So this is a program that we want to implement throughout the region. There are many things that could be said about the Productivity Pact, but I want to conclude here, and I conclude with three messages. The first message is that Latin America has not wasted the commodity boom. Latin America has made significant progress in macroeconomic stability and also in social transformation. Now, you may be able to explain what type of policies can be implemented or if we only have 20% of middle class and almost 60% of our population lives in conditions of poverty. But despite that, the social reforms have been far-reaching. We are building means of uh, communicating amongst our societies. We cannot lose macroeconomic stability. We have to fiscally be responsible, and we have to keep the debt product ratio under control. We cannot fall into the temptations of the past. And to consolidate all of this and to close this circle, we need and this is my final message. We need that productivity pact. It has to have a long-term view and be supported by consensus to lead us along the path towards prosperity. There is no shortcut. Thank you.